Uh, we'll be discussing uh, syphilis and tuberculosis today uh, as examples of granulomatose diseases. Syphilis or Lewis is a chronic venereal infection caused by the spirochet Trypanema pallidum, first recognized in epidemic form in the 16th century Europe as the Great Pox. Syphilis is endemic in all parts of the world. In the United States, 20,000 cases of primary and secondary syphilis were reported to the CDC in 2014, representing almost a threefold increase since the year 2000. The increase, for the most part, can be attributed to the increased incidence uh, in men who have sex with men. During 2013 and 2014, uh, the incidence began to increase in women as well, raising the concern that there may be an impeding increase in cases of congenital syphilis acquired from the mother. A strong racial disparity is evident, and African Americans are affected six times more often than whites. Syphilis also is more common in HIV-infected patients in whom syphilis is more likely to progress to organ involvement in neurosyphilis. Trypanema pallidum, uh, as seen on the picture, is a fastidious organism whose only natural host is a person, human being. Um, the usual source of infection is contact with a cutaneous or mucosal lesion in a sexual partner in the early primary or secondary stages of syphilis. The organism is transmitted from such lesions during sexual activity through minute breaks in the skin or mucous membranes of the uninfected partner. In congenital cases, uh, trypanema pallidum is transmitted across the placenta from mother to fetus, particularly during the early stages of maternal infections. Once introduced into the body, the organisms rapidly disseminate to distant sites through lymphatics and the blood, even before the appearance of lesions at the primary inoculation site. This widespread dissemination accounts for the protein manifestations of the disease, as seen on the picture, which in adults can be divided into primary, secondary and tertiary stages. Several weeks after infection, um, and usually at 21, after 21 days, a primary lesion termed a chancre appears at the point of spirochet entry. Systemic dissemination of organisms occurs during this period while the host mounts an immune response. Two types of antibodies are formed. Antibodies that cross-react with host constituents non-trypanemal antibodies and antibodies to specific trypanemal antigens. This humoral response, however, fails to eradicate the organisms. Primary syphilis is characterized by chancre or multiple chancres at the point of entry of trypanema pallidum spirochet. Uh, T. pallidum uses its spiral shape to twist into the skin. A painless ulcer results, as shown on the picture. Typically, a solitary, small, firm, red, painless papule on the genital area quickly becomes a painless ulcer with a well-defined well -defined margin and, and an indurated base. Multiple chancres occur in 30% of cases. The initial ulcerated chancre may go unnoticed, particularly if hidden inside the vagina, cervix, mouth or on the anal region. Non-tender lymphadenopathy might occur in the region of ulcerations. Uh, the ulcer usually heals without treatment within a few weeks. The chancre of primary syphilis resolves spontaneously over a period of four to six weeks and is followed in approximately 25% of untreated patients by the development of secondary syphilis. The manifestations of secondary syphilis discussed in greater detail later include generalized lymphadenopathy and mucocutaneous lesions. The mucocutaneous lesions of both primary and secondary syphilis are teeming with spirochetes and are highly infectious. 
Like the Shankar, the lesions of secondary syphilis resolve even without antimicrobial therapy, at which point patients are said to be an early latent phase syphilis. Secondary syphilis becomes generalized. Secondary syphilis is characterized by rash and systemic symptoms during which the patient is very infectious. If the patient is untreated, the symptoms will eventually resolve over a number of weeks, but they can recur. Untreated, 25% of patients develop secondary syphilis within three months after the initial shankar. Syphilis is a multi-system infection and the patient is very infectious during this stage. Systemic symptoms may include fever, headache, malaise, myalgia, myalgia arteralgia, and lymphadenopathy. Other affected organs can include liver, kidney, central nervous system, joints, and eyes. Cutaneous um, Features of secondary syphilis uh, are the following. A non-itchy rash is present in 90% of patients with secondary syphilis. The rash might be subtle or might appear as rough red or reddish-brown papules or plaques, as on the left picture. The rash occurs typically on the trunk and frequently affects palms and soles. Rarely, the rash presents as a cluster of erythematous papules around a central scaly plaque resembling a flower. This floral morphology is described as corimbo syphilis. Patchy hair loss can occur. Mucosal surfaces, such as inside the mouth, throat, genital area, vagina and anus, can become raw and red. Grayish white moist plaques occur in the groin, inner thighs, armpits, umbilicus, or under the breasts. These are called condyloma lata, as shown on the picture on the right. Tertiary syphilis is very delayed, occurring decades after the initial infection. Late signs and symptoms can develop 20 to 40 years after the initial infection in up to one third of untreated cases. The untreated infection can lead to endarteritis and complications include gamma, cardiovascular and neurological diseases. A gamma is a solitary granulomatous lesion with central necrosis. Gammas typically occur on the skin or bone but can be found anywhere. Skin gammas can be painless, but gammas in lawn bones cause a deep, boring pain that is worse at night. Cardiovascular disease is a rare complication. The aorta is the most likely organ affected and becomes dilated, resulting in aortic aneurysm and aortic regurgitation. Neurosyphilis can present as meningovascular disease, as general paresis, and as tabis dorsalis, which, is, which, leads, which means wasting away of the spinal cord. Trypanema pallidum also may be transmitted across the placenta from an infected mother to the fetus at any time during pregnancy, leading to the development of congenital syphilis. The likelihood of transmission is greatest during the early stages of disease, when spirochetes are most numerous. Because the manifestations of maternal disease may be subtle, routine serologic testing for syphilis is mandatory in all pregnancies. The stigmata of congenital syphilis typically do not develop until after the fourth month, month of pregnancy. In the absence of treatment, as many as 40% of infected inf inf infants die in utero, typically after the fourth month. The incidence of congenital syphilis is expected to rise because infection rates in women have increased in recent years. Untreated maternal syphilis can lead to miscarriage, stillbirth or congenital infection. Many infants with congenital syphilis will be asymptomatic at birth. Congenital syphilis is divided into early and late stages. In the first few weeks of life, the effects to the infant resemble secondary syphilis with a multi-organ infection. 
the infected skin and mucosa can present as a macular papular rash, vesicular bullous lesions, mucous patches, condyloma lata, or as rhinitis, inflamed mucous membrane in the nose causing snuffles. Other affected organs include the bones, kidney, liver, and lymph nodes. Neurological, ocular, and hematological involvement also can occur. Late congenital syphilis presents similarly to the tertiary, tertiary gammatose syphilis in adult infection with chronic persistent inflammation. This chronic infection often affects the eyes, ears, bones, joints, and central nervous system. Characteristic signs include Hutchinson incisors, as on the picture on the left, mulberry molars, typical facial appearance, bowed sabre shins, and swollen knees. The pathognomonic microscopic lesion of syphilis is a proliferative and arthritis with an accompanying inflammatory infiltrate reaching plasma cells. And arthritis has a central role in tissue injury at all sites involved by syphilis, but its path pathogenesis is not understood. There is no evidence that the spirochetes cause any damage to host tissues directly. Instead, it is thought that the host immune response is responsible for the endothelial cell activation and proliferation that is the hallmark of the end arteritis, which eventually leads to perivascular fibrosis and luminal narrowing. Both primary and secondary syphilis are associated with characteristic lesions. The chancre of primary syphilis is typically indurated and has been referred to as a hard chancre to distinguish it from the soft chancre or of chancroid caused by hemophilus ducre. The primary chancre in males usually is on the glands, corona, or perianal region. In females, multiple chancres may be present, usually on the labial or vagina as well as the perianal region. The chancre begins as a small painless firm papule two to four weeks after sexual exposure, with gradually which gradually enlarges to produce a painless ulcer with well-defined indurated margins and a clean mo moist base, as shown on the left picture. Regional lymph nodes often are slightly enlarged and firm. <coughs> Microscopic examination of the ulcer reveals the typical lymphotic, lymphocytic, and plasmacytic inflammatory infiltrate as on the picture on the left, and end arthritis. Spirochetes are readily demonstra demonstrable in histologic sections as on the picture on the right, and can be seen in early lesions with the use of standard silver stains or immunohistochemical stains specific for spirochetes. Within approximately two months of resolution of the chancre, the lesions of secondary syphilis appear. The manifestations of secondary syphilis are varied, but typically include a combination of generalized lymph node enlargement and a variety of mucocutaneous lesions. Skin lesions usually are symmetrically distributed, maybe macular papula, scaly, or pustula, and characteristically involve the palms of the hands, as on the picture, and soles of the feet. In moist skin areas, such as the anogenital region, inner thighs, and axillae, broad-based elevated lesions termed condylomata lata may appear. <coughs> and this should not be confused with condyloma acuminata caused by HPV. Superficial mucosal lesions resembling condylomata lata can occur anywhere, but are particularly common in the oral cavity and pharynx and on the external genitalia. Histologic examination of mucocutaneous lesions during the secondary phase of disease reveals the characteristic proliferative and arteritis 
as seen on the picture on the left. And with special stains or immunohistochemistry, spirochetes can could be seen because they are abundant as demonstrated on the picture on the right. Lymphadenopathy is most common in the neck and inguinal areas. Histologic examination of enlarged nodes demonstrates hyperplasia of germinal centers accompanied by increased numbers of plasma cells, or less commonly granulomas or neutrophils. Less common manifestations of secondary syphilis include hepatitis, renal disease, eye disease, and gastrointestinal abnormalities. Lesions associated with tertiary syphilis develop in approximately one-third of untreated patients, usually after a latent period of five years or more. Gamma is a localized area of necrosis which may affect large parts of any organ or tissue, but particularly bones, testes, and liver. Uh, the arc and thoracic aorta is damaged with weakening of the media. This leads to aneurysm formation, which causes serious local pressure effects and may also rupture with several hemorrhage. There is also neurological syphilis. Uh, men meningovascular mainly affects the meningeal blood vessels and causes neurological impairment secondarily. And then there is also a parenchymal syphilis. <coughs> During the microscopic examination, the gamma contains a central zone of coagulative necrosis surrounded by dense fibrous tissue containing a mixed inflammatory infiltrate composed of lymphocytes, plasma cells, activated macrophages, and occasional giant cells, features that suggest a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. Gammas occur most commonly in bone, skin, and the mucous membranes of the upper airway and mouth, but any organ may be affected. Spirochetes are only rarely demonstrable. And the co once common, gammas have become exceedingly rare thanks to effective antibiotics such as penicillin. They are reported now mostly in patients with AIDS. You could see um, syphilitic gamma on, on the pictures on the slide, the marked ring-like enhancement on the left picture shown, um, signified by the white arrow, um, with a dural tail as on the picture uh, in the middle, and hematoxylene and erythrin staining reveals a small hemorrhage and extensive inflammatory cell infiltration, predominantly of lymphocytes and plasma cell, shown by the arrows, in the gamma. Cardiovascular syphilis takes the form of syphilitic arthritis, as on the picture uh, on the slide, and accounts for more than 80% of cases of tertiary disease. It is much more common in men than in women. Gross morphological features of the disease have following characteristics. Diffuse thickening of the wall of the ascending aorta, with gelatinous intimal plaques separated by furrows, creases, and radiating scars, the tree bark appearance uh, should be considered. Um, Syphilitic arthritis mimics a variety of inflammatory aortic diseases. Uh, we also rely on blood serology and the presence of chronic mesoarthritis. Medial scare in pervascular lymphoplasmatic infiltrate and, and arteritis obliterans, as shown on the picture for the diagnosis. Sections were taken from the various aortic segments and stained by hematoxylin eosine and elastic van Gison stains. Depending on the presence of complicated lesions, such as aortic regurgitation, coronary osteostenosis, and aneurysm formation, the cases were classified as uncomplicated or complicated arthritis. Neurosyphilis accounts for 10% of cases of tertiary syphilis and exists in five forms, which may be further classified as early and late neurosyphilis. Asymptomatic neurosyphilis is the most common form and occurs before symptomatic syphilis develops. 
Patients are unaware that they are affected and have no signs of neurological disease. It is defined by the presence of CSF abnormalities in a patient with serological evidence of syphilis but no neurological symptom. Prior to penicillin, the diagnosis of asymptomatic neurosyphilis was significant in predicting the prognosis and the outcomes of patients regarding the neurological sequelae of syphilis. Meningeal syphilis results from diffuse inflammation of the meninges. Typical meningeal symptoms include headache, nausea, vomiting, neck stiffness, photophobia, cranial nerve deficits, and possibly seizures. Meningovascular syphilis is defined as the inflammation of the meninges as well as end arteritis causing thrombosis and infarction of cerebral tissue. Early symptoms are nonspecific and include headache, nausea, vomiting and vertigo. It causes cerebral vascular syndrome and the symptoms depend on, depend on the site of thrombosis and the corresponding cerebral functions. Spinal cord vessels may also be affected, resulting in meningomyelitis and spastic weakness, particularly in the lower extremities, sensory loss and muscular atrophy. Um, in cases of late neurosyphilis, also known as parenchymal, general paresis, paral paresis general paralysis of the insane paralytic dementia. It is due to chronic meningoencephalitis resulting in cerebral atrophy. Symptoms um, of paraphic neurosyphilis can be further divided into early and late symptoms and can occur insidiously or suddenly. Early symptoms include more disturbances such as irritability, personality changes, changes in sleep habits and forgetfulness. Late symptoms include labile, labile mood, memory and judgment impairment, confusion, delusions and seizures. Psych psychiatric diseases include depression, delirium, mania, and psychosis that also result from this form of neurosyphilis. Neurologically, one may see papillary abnormalities, dysarthria, and tremors. Tambes dorsalis results from the generation of the posterior dorsal colon and roots of the spinal cord. Classically, patients have ataxia, lightning, pains, um, bladder dysfunction, parastheasis, and vision changes. Additional neurologic deficits include papillary abnormalities, ocular pulses, diminished reflexes, vibra vibratory, and proprioceptive impairments, ocular pulses, and charcoal joints. According to the National Institute of Health, the prognosis of patients presenting with neurosyphilis is mostly dependent on the type of neurosyphilis and early detection of the disease. Patients who present with asymptomatic or meningeal neurosyphilis generally return to normal health if treated adequately. Patients Uh, who patients with meningovascular disease, general paresis or tabis dorsalis may improve but usually do not return to their health or functional baseline. Furthermore, patients who are treated years after initial infection tend to have more poor prognosis. While neurosyphilis itself is a complication of syphilis, untreated neurosyphilis can result in devastating neurological sequelae including permanent paralysis, dementia, and death. Treatment should be initiated immediately, as some complications may be reversible and the success of therapy has an inverse relationship to the duration of untreated infection.